Uh, hopefully folks can hear me. We're going to get started. Thank you for accommodating a little bit of a delay here. So good to see a lot of people in the audience in this hybrid format. Um, I'm Eric Chung. I'm Chief Medical Officer for the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to introduce our two speakers for today's Grand Rounds, Psychiatric Advocacy, our shared responsibility. I've known both of them for quite some time in different capacities. Um, to introduce to you first, Dr. Shainer, uh, and, and a quick quip, I met Dr. Shainer when I came to UCLA as an intern and joined SCPS really quickly uh, at that point, and, and we were working on a conflicts of interest policy for SCPS at that time, and I got quite the education from Dr. Shainer about how to write policy um, and learned a, a ton from him um, in his technical abilities of having crafted policy for, for a long, long time. Uh, Dr. Shainer is a past president of the SCPS, Southern California Psychiatric Society, and currently serves as the co-chair of the SCPS GA, Government Affairs Committee, and chair of the California State Association of Psychiatrists Board. He's committed to mental health advocacy at the SCPS and state association levels, participating in crafting of legislative bills and policy statements over many years. Over the course of his career, he served as director of LAC and USC's Psychiatric Emergency Services, something near and dear to my heart, medical director of LA County DMH for 23 years until 2019, and medical director of a behavioral health managed care company and has maintained a private practice. He's a graduate of UCLA School of Medicine, did his residency and fellowship at USC, and is accredited in general child and adolescent geriatric psych psychiatry and addiction medicine. And anything else oh, you'd like to add to that? Okay. Um, our uh, co-speaker today is Dr. Wood. I, when I think of Dr. Wood, I think of uh, a definition uh, in the dictionary and the word advocate, and I see Dr. Wood's picture right next to it. Dr. Wood has been a member of SCPS and APA since 2016. She established the SCPS Committee for Alternatives to Incarceration in 2021 and serves as its current chair and was instrumental in the passage of the recent Assembly Bill in California 988. She's co-chair of the SCPS GA Committee and prior chair of the California State Association of Psychiatrists Government Affairs Committee from 22 to 23. For many years, Dr. Wood has been active in the care of patients in the juvenile justice and correctional health services. She's a mental health consultant and educator for the Urban Peace Institute and the California Collaborative Justice Courts Advisory Committee. She served on numerous committees at UCLA during her time here and in our professional societies related to JEDI and anti-racism. She currently serves as medical director and psychiatrist for Spectrum Psych LA and is a psychiatrist with the Community West Mental Health PHP IOP. She completed her residency in 2018 at UCLA, followed by her child adolescent fellowship, and before all that, her MD PhD at Johns Hopkins in 2015. Uh, we have a uh, additional introduction from SCPS current president and UCLA alum, uh, Dr. Gallia Reese. So I'll have Dr. Gallia Reese come up to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang, and thank you everyone for being here. I, yes, I am a past resident here at UCLA and also past medical students. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so eight years ago, I believe in this very room, a psychiatrist that I really admired asked me and my fellow residents before we graduated to make a commitment. Um, and if I recall correctly, his ask was to give back to the next generation of psychiatry through teaching, mentorship, or supervision. So spoiler alert, I'm going to ask you today at the end of this talk to extend that commitment and give back to psychiatry by supporting psychiatric advocacy. Advocacy for our patients and for our beautiful profession because no one will do this advocacy and no one will support this advocacy if we don't. So 
let's see, how do I plant this? Okay, so the goals of the talk today are to understand what psychiatric advocacy is and why it is important for our patients and for our profession, to review some recent SCPS advocacy priorities, to outline ways by which we can all be involved in advocacy and hopefully to convince you all to make that lifelong commitment to supporting psychiatric advocacy. And I'm going to get us started with four frustrating cases. The first case is of a young adult male with severe autism, psychosis, lots of hospitalizations and arrests for agitation, who's in your ER for days, if not weeks, waiting for a hospital bed. The second case is of a seventh grader with ADHD who previously did really well on his Adderall. However, uh, recently he has not been able to get his Adderall and now he has uh, worsening of emotional dysregulation and he's failing in his classes in school, at school. The third case is a middle-aged uh, woman with schizophrenia who's been stable on clozapine for more than 15 years, never been neutropenic. However, unfortunately, now she's completely psychotic because she had to miss one monthly lab during a family emergency trip and couldn't get her clozapine. And finally, we have the case of a 30th. 30-ish-year-old psychiatry resident whose status posted a two-hour prior authorization phone call or a doctor-to-doctor -doctor utilization review. And with these uh, frustrating cases in mind, I'd like to uh, turn the stage over to our advocacy experts, Drs. Wood and Shainer. Emily. Thank you, Dalia. Thank you. Yes, which of these, um, given in your opinion, is uh, currently experiencing the most distress? Maybe the, the, the psychiatry resident, hard to say. Um, so, um, I'm very excited. My watch just told me that I have a very high heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> so in case they were sure. <laughs> I could. I apparently cannot pretend that I'm not anxious because my watch will alert you. Um, and as a and just to even go further, I will say that I was here for six years and gave many presentations at UCLA, and not once did I print out my notes because it was never as important to me as this talk to you about advocacy, and I mean that seriously. Um, so those frustrating cases, you know, the, the frustrations plus experience that you guys are, are getting in residency and, and those of you who have been doing this for a really long time, um, uh, that's the experience and expertise that we need with those frustrations to drive our actions for social, organizational, and policy changes, both for our patients and for each other. Um, one way you could break down the kind of advocacy we do is that it's it's proactive. Um, we we uh, look at things that are happening to our patients, to each other, and we then we go out and we work with ally, allies like NAMI, uh, legislators, other groups to uh, see if we can put forth legislation, change regulations, change how money is spent, and then you know implement the laws and and enforce them. Um, and that's something that we are doing at SCPS. Uh, we also do more reactive advocacy. Um, we um, sometimes oppose or support bills authored by other people. Um, some, when there are crises happening in the world, we uh, reach out to our members and, and our patients to see if there's ways that we can help understand those emerging issues. Yeah. When there are medication shortages, um, we are behind the scenes doing what we can to, to make that um, better. And we also do things like respond to requests for information. So you guys have maybe have been on the roller coaster of what telehealth rules will be like, you know, in the future and over the last few years. And every time those requests for information come out about what we're experiencing, we are responding to those um, in addition to, to what you might be doing. So, you know, we represent a really diverse group of patients, many of whom really can't advocate for themselves and, and we represent each other. And that's really what we're here for. Um, so that's the answer to this question. Who needs it? Our patients and, and us. Um, our patients need 
uh, parity for their mental health treatment. They need access to the right and best mental health care that they deserve. Um, our patients need really good civil commitment law that protects their rights, but also uh, protects their right to care. Um, we have to recognize that our patients are not receiving care um, in the same way based on many socioeconomic factors and social justice is a really big part of what we do for our, our patients. Um, we have, you know, mental health crisis response is one way that, um, that we are understand we, we really need to work on our system and that's something that our patients need. Medication shortages, you know, when they can't get their medications that we're prescribing for them, it doesn't matter if we wrote it in our note and sent in the prescription, if they can't get it, it really it's not helping. For each other, we know that our education and our and our licenses, you know, we need to understand, always be improving the education process, always be making sure that the licensing makes sense and is is um, there to make sure that the best doctors are, are on the front lines. Um, compensation matters. And so things like making sure that when um, the Centers for Medicare and Medi-Cal are looking at how they're going to uh, pay doctors and psychiatrists and mental health professionals, speaking up for each other and saying, hey, we you you can't go down uh, this year. That's, that's not going to work. Um, talking about our liability and then really our, the quality of our, our life, which in this, you know, for us, our work life, how much paperwork, how much time are we spending on prior offs and documentation and all of this stuff, um, that's stuff that matters to us. And um, that's what, what we're working on um, when, um, in, our, in our society. So that brings me to um, have Rod come up here to talk about who is involved in this Thanks. process. Thanks, Emily. So if I can borrow your watch, I want to check my heart rate. <laughs> If, if if it's high, it's only because I've never done a hybrid meeting before, and I'm wondering how you make these slides go forward. Oh, em just, Emily is my... Uh, just click. Just press, yeah. press something. Okay, great. So, well, first of all, it's great to be here and to be in an in-person meeting. I'm used to just talking to a screen. So uh, I think the most and one thing we should recognize first is this is a really exciting time to be talking about involvement in advocacy. In the last two years, we've probably arguably made more strides in successful psychiatric advocacy than in at least the last 10 years. Why is that? Who's involved? And most importantly, how do we continue this success? Because we still have a lot more to do. So here's just some of the players involved. The first one, government. Well, there's a big change. Government, good or bad, uh, in California has taken an inordinate interest in mental health issues over the last few years. Before that, there were just crickets up there. Perhaps it's driven in part by homelessness crisis, recognition of the impact of drugs on mental health and other things. But they are focused at the highest level on us. Governor Newsom last week, you may have seen his letter to all of the California County Boards of Supervisors berating them for slow walking the implementation of SB 43, the landmark change, uh, more change in that bill, sponsored by psychiatry, by the way, more changes in that bill than since the inception of LPS. Um, but many other things as well. Tomorrow, a bill called SB 1238 uh, carried again, sponsored by psychiatry and carried by uh, Susan Eggman, another state senator, uh, is starts its trek through the second half of the legislative session. SB 1238 is designed to thwart attempts to mire the implementation of SB 43 and its important changes to LPS, to mire that implementation in obsolete regulatory tangles. And so there's a lot riding on that bill as well. Another, our a local state senator, uh, Henry Stern, is championing changes in uh, the way that we manage and provide care for individuals who are incarcerated. 
in jails and prisons. You may have read the LA Times in the last two days. It turns out LA County isn't getting rid of its jail after all, but that does not mean that we can let up on efforts, spearheaded in large part by Emily and others, to have diversion that works for those who can manage it. Another major player are psychiatric organizations. They are, have been increasingly sophisticated in advocacy over the last few years, developing expertise in contacting other groups, in working with state legislators, and in bringing ideas to meaningful legislation. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The power that we have as psychiatric organizations is we have credibility, and we have clinical expertise. There is another kind of organizational basis, patient-centered organizations that also have tremendous credibility and also a power that comes from a different place, from lived experience and from the stories, both inspiring and harrowing behind it that legislators, media, and the public can relate to. We partner with them whenever we can. It's a powerful combination. There are many other organizations in this advocacy space as well. There are other professional organizations. CMA, California Medical Association, comes to mind, and a host of others. There are industry associations immediately. California Hospital Association comes to mind, and many others that have interest in mental health and its social and economic consequences and governmental groups as well. When we can, a psychiatric organization, we partner with these groups to move legislation. And when we absolutely cannot agree, we take principled opposition and we mean it, but we maintain our relationships so we can work together in the future. Yeah, I'm going to try to change the slide. There goes my heart rate. It worked. Okay. Um, this is much more familiar to me as a screen to talk to people with squares. Uh, there's an old saying that all politics is local, but it has never been this local, especially if you're an advocate in Southern California, where meaningful advocacy at state level meant either arduous trips north into that strange land north of Lancaster, um, or being on difficult phone calls, but it was a burden. Now it's hyperlocal, it's on your computer screen where we can meet with legislators, other advocates, we can form relationships, we can build policy together, we can move legislation in our living room if we want. We can maintain busy practices, family life, and still involve ourselves in advocacy in ways we could never do before. And that has really shown up in the success that we've had. NAMI is a special case. Organization centered in lived experience. Families, mostly people with mental illness and people with mental illness themselves. They have that credibility and they also have a close connection with we as mental health professionals and psychiatrists. On a local level, we work closely with our NAMIs. We involve their leadership, not only in discussions, but in our actual policy groups and committees, formulating policy together and then bringing it to legislators with clinicians and families and patients in a way we haven't been able to do before. And that's been very helpful. Looking at psychiatric organizations, what do we mean? Um, psychiatric organ advocacy organizations are under the umbrella of the American Psychiatric Association. That means something. These are member-directed organizations. We as psychiatrists don't just give input to groups. This is our group. We direct policy. We shape it and we move it as only clinical psychiatrists who work together can do. The American Psychiatric Association is the overall association nationally. It works to develop national policy through its staff and through its components. 
is involved in many things right now. Probably the major topics include parity legislation, reform of Medicare and Medicare rates, telemental health, and a host of other things. If you're paying attention to national politics and who isn't, you may imagine that it's difficult to get anybody's attention right now for some of these issues, given the uncertainties of what policies we'll have next year. But um, we continue to be right there and ready to go forward as soon as we know what administration is happening. On the opposite part of the scale, on a local level, Southern California Psychiatric Association is the grassroots organization where members, people like you and I, anybody can come, contribute ideas. It's easy, you pick up the phone. Um, Mindy was up on the screen somewhere before. We have an executive director who knows practically every psychiatrist in the SCPS area. It's weird. She knows your name and who you are and will take your question, help you formulate it, and put you in touch with anybody who knows anything about it who will call back in a few minutes. You can't do that except at a local level. Um, but Southern California Psychiatric Association represents LA and our four neighboring counties, San Bernardino, Riverside, Ventura, Santa Barbara, but we have a special challenge. In almost every state in the United States, there's a district branch, and that district branch is a district branch for the state. There's only two states that don't have that. One is New York, and who understands them at all? And then there's California, which has five district branches. And that means to be effective at a state level, we have to work together democratically with member involvement in order to build our ideas, strengthen them, and pool our resources to secure the services of one of the largest and most respected professional advocacy firms in California called SYASL, which is not a catchy name. Uh, it's the first initials of all of the principles. We have one assigned full-time to us, Paul Yoder. What SYASL does is it takes our good ideas and constantly reminds those of us who think we know how to write policy that we really don't. It's best left to professionals, shapes those, connects with legislators who will author our efforts, helps us build relationships with them, create real bills, develop coalitions with them, and shepherd those bills through a very arduous legislative process, which is life-changing to anybody that goes up there to testify for it, and ultimately brings them to fruition. SYASL also tracks the dozens of mental health related bills every year, analyze them for us and guide our taking of positions, oppose support and in between positions that have major impact on the outcomes of these bills, either getting them in or voting them down, but more usually modifying them so that they are more helpful to our patients and our profession. Um, CSAP also has another function, which is to interface with the national staff at APA and to ensure that California's voice is heard on a national level. California is one of the leaders in mental health reform, and we have to continue that. And Emily will come up and tell us how we organize. Yeah, so, you know, just to carry that idea home about what, what is organized psychiatry, you know, um, you may have been thinking about it. Who knows what, who knows what you were thinking, but it's networking, it's community, it's mentorship, it's education. But for us, for the people who are here today with you, um, it's advocating for our patients. And, and that's really where we find a lot of meaning in, in, um, in what we do. I'm going to actually skip the video for right now because we're, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about the issues. Um, so we'll we'll sort of go back to that if we have time, and but also we can send out a link.
Um, so we just wanted to give a little overview of some things that we have been working on. Um, so a big uh, issue that you guys may have heard about um, is the expansion of grave disability, um, the definition of grave disability criteria and Prop 1. We've also been working on the stimulant crisis. Um, we have been working to close the RESC gap, and you, if you don't know what that is, we'll describe it a little bit, very briefly, and then just generally other um, access to care issues like um, that, you know, we can talk about. Um, but thinking about um, the this you know SB forty three that was the grave disability bill and Prop One, um, what what we did is really when Rod said that more has happened in the last couple of years than happened in the maybe ten years or if not more before. What we really mean is that the focus on serious mental illness, the patients that you guys are seeing in the hospital, um, though that's really what has been on the rise. Um, and SB 43 was the first change in California mental health law, um, cons uh, conservatorship law um, in over 60 years. So it, it was really, um, uh, really a big deal. Um, uh, many SCPS members have been clear about concerns about it. Um, and even even expressed opposition. And we have been listening to those issues. We have been listening to everyone in, in the organization along the way. But to um, put it um, uh, as you know, succinctly as possible, um, grave disability, as you well know, uh, currently and through in LA County, probably all the way, they'll push it to the very end to January 1st, 2026, is currently defined by your ability to access food, shelter, and clothing. And we've all had patients for whom that was not an adequate way to describe their ability to function in the world, um, their ability to provide safety for themselves, um, and their ability to uh, provide the proper medical care for themselves or, or other important issues. And those were added to the, um, the criteria for grave disability with SB 43. Um, we um, we also, uh, th with that expansion, we're hoping to be able to um, provide the long-term care to more people. The other major thing that was added was the addition of substance use disorders as a, um, as a single, you don't have to have a substance use disorder plus a mental health disorder as if those are different things. Um, so uh, you can have a standalone substance use disorder um, that if you meet criteria for grave disability, um, then, uh, then you can be held and given the treatment you need because you're not being able to take care of yourself. And that's the changes that happened with grave dis uh, with SB 43. Um, Prop one, um, and this is, um, this. I'll explain the picture. This is uh, me, I got to, I, I worked really closely with um, Susan Eggman's team. Um, this is Senator Eggman here. Um, and um, she uh, put forward SB 43 with it. We co-sponsored it and, and others. And so I got to go when the bill was signed. He, he actually like, he's holding the little folder again. He actually like signed it on top of the bear. Like that was the thing. Um, so that's where we're standing by the bear. Um, but um, here we have Jessica Cruz from NAMI California. Um, me, our governor Newsom, Susan Engman, um, Randall Hager from PPAC, Jessica Thackerberry, who um, this last year was the um, the president of sure. chair chair of the board of of the California State Association of Psychiatrists, and then also Daryl Steinberg, uh, the mayor of Sacramento, who has been a major mental health advocate for many many years. Um, so that was really exciting, but. Um, the other thing that happened recently was Prop 1, um, and that is really an effort to uh, modernize the behavioral health delivery system in California to improve accountability is a huge part of it, um, and increase transparency and expand the capacity to, uh, to provide behavioral health care facilities and care to Californians, especially those with serious mental illness. Um, the, the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, BHCIP, but sometimes called BCHIP, is has been already in the works for a while, but that's the um, program through which um, the Department of Healthcare Services has already awarded many grants um, competitively to um, construct, acquire, and expand properties. So this is in the past, and Prop 1 just 
increases funding to those programs um, to expand to serve even more Californians, um, especially with mental health and substance use disorders. And what uh, Prop 1 did was also um, require that um, a certain proportion of the funds that counties spend be um, when spent for mental health care, especially for serious mental illness, be uh, be put into housing for those individuals with the understanding that um, without uh, without stable housing, you could give someone all the mental health care in the world, but if they don't have a stable place to live, it's not it's not going to do a lot for them. Um, some of the things that we uh, we were you know we were going through as Prop One and the bills that put it that came out to be Prop One were were go going through last year. We were reading them um, every you know every version that came out and providing um, lots of feedback to um, the governor's office and um, Senator Eggman, for instance, who one of the you know the one of the bills was um, presented by. Um, one thing that was critical um, that we got at the last minute um, in in um, in you know depending on how you look at it in small part or, and you know, we were part of a, a group of advocates ad, who um, were pushing for the funds to be able to be spent on locked facilities. Um, as it, it is, um, it is not sexy to, uh, to pay for locked facilities. No one wants to do that. And um, we as psychiatrists need to be advocates for our patients who um, have little insight and without care um, uh, really struggle to, to maintain their own health and, and dignity, frankly. And so we um, really have to advocate for the patients and their families, for those who, who do benefit from locked beds, um, in addition to every other kind of bed across the continuum. But that's what Prop 1 is doing. And um, uh, Rod already pointed out that um, there's also a bill coming out this year to sort of shore up some of the issues with the expansion of grave disability to include um, standalone substance use disorders. And that, that, you know, everyone said, oh my God, we can't do that because the rules are that you can't have people with a substance use disorder in this place with the definition of that. And, so that's what um, uh, 1238, uh, SB 1238 is, is working on, is making sure it's understood that substance use disorders are mental health disorders. Um, when a person is experiencing a substance use disorder to the extent that they are gravely disabled, um, they, they're, they need care, and that there are many different um, uh, places in our system along the continuum that can provide that care and that that the Medi-Cal needs to be able to pay for them there um, and, and, and so, uh, such and so forth. So that's what we're trying to establish with 1238. Um, then, Rod, do you want to talk about the next one? You may notice, you may, you guys may recognize this guy. <laughs> I think we should just enjoy this photo. I, I, I could spend a day looking at this. So to me, this photo distills the impact of personal psychiatric advocacy being there. This is Dr. Chung at a Senate committee hearing giving testimony. He is sitting there and above him are senators staring at him and he is projecting professionalism, clinical acumen, integrity. He is translating complex psychiatric principles into language that any legislator or the media can understand. And he is humanizing the face of psychiatry and psychiatrists. The best lobbyists in the world cannot do that for us. We have to do it ourselves. And we need to nurture the ability of our profession to continue to do this, starting with residency training. That is a key and organized psychiatric or advocacy groups can help do that. It is essential for our work for the future. I think it's, there's a few other, there are other additional advocacy priorities. There are many, there's one for everybody in this room. You can sign up afterward. Um, probably some of the 
biggest ones are care court implementation. You remember care court? Care court establishes an entire new judicial structure for identifying the, pe the people with the most severe mental illnesses that fall between the cracks and ensure that counties take responsibility for providing that treatment and patients have responsibilities for completing that treatment. So you may say, okay, well, been there, done that. Let's just rest on our laurels, but we cannot. The key for any legislation is implementation. It's an opportunity for mischief to come back and vitiate those important new systems. And right now, counties have not implemented this very far at all. And SCPS is working with our local counties. We meet with their planning groups, which they have to have and ensure that psychiatric input is an important part of making care court work. Alternatives to incarceration, we have Senator Henry Stern, uh, who is very much involved in this and we're working on uh, a variety of potential bills to help make this system more useful and more fair. Access to care in part is concrete things, medications, LAIs, clozapine, but it is also access to quality of care. You may have seen, I think it was in JAMA, recent study of cold calling of patients who have Medi-Cal trying to get a psychiatric appointment. So a research group just called psychiatrists. We in California and LA in particular came in last. What percent of patients do you think were successful with Medi-Cal in getting a psychiatric appointment and calling a, psychi a psychiatrist or a psychiatric group. I'll tell you, it was 15%. That's not very good. And that is with appointments stretched six months into advance. The nation didn't do much better with Medicaid. The average was in the 30s. But Nothing to write home about, about that either. There are many other aspects of quality of care, including quality of care in emergency settings, especially non-psychiatric emergency settings, and getting the people the care they need in the emergency room and to the right place. And there's a lot of work on that. We, even as psychiatric organizations, don't agree on everything. Psychedelics is one example of that. Uh, there was a bill this year that we were instrumental as psychiatrists in defeating, although many of our colleagues were concerned about this, in making decriminalizing psilocybin and creating a kind of a pseudo-medical prescribing model. It's not that we don't want innovative treatments for our patients or to develop the research necessary to back it. It's that we also believe that patient safety is important and that we cannot use the traipsings of medical treatment as a substitute for uh, getting the right evidence. We have vivid memories of medical cannabis and we don't want to go back to that. And there are many other opportunities as well. So back to hands-on psychiatry, Emily. Yes. So I want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, if we want to talk about the stimulant shortage, feel free to ask me. I can just say um, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about how law enforcement and managed care and research and how bottom-up grassroots advocacy um, is important and that you have to really have a deep understanding to uncover the forces at play. So I'm happy to talk about it. Um, so um, how can you become involved in advocacy or how can all of us um, is, is why we're here today. And I um, am very proud of this um, thing, I, this graphic that I made. So thank you. Um, obviously I've made very little of it. I just put the two things together, but I think it's extremely clever. Um, so um, so the question is what, um, what, how can you be involved? Um, and we're, we have some ideas. Um, and, and really, I think it's just, just, just to, to step back a sec, you know, we, the field of psychiatry needs 
It needs some key things. It needs all of us, like good, hardworking psychiatrists who dedicate a significant amount of time to, you know, to in our life to patient care. And it, it needs um, high quality training to, to, to make these, you know, psychiatrists and, and educators and mentors. And it needs research and, and development of the new treatments and evidence-based data and guidelines. We need all of these things. And it really needs good policy it turns out, because especially, especially in mental health care, people want, people have a lot of ideas of what mental health care should and shouldn't be, and they want to legislate it. And if that is going to be the case in the way we do it in our country, then we absolutely need to be at that table. It, it's, it's, you, you can't get away from it. There's, if you do appendectomies all day long, probably you don't need to be going to the, the Capitol much. But our patients, our patients need us to be advocating for them because our patients are those who, as a part of their health condition, often cannot advocate for themselves. And we are the ones who understand them and their families the most. Um, so we need to be there and we need to be creating good policy. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can be involved in that. You can just, you can stay informed and know what's going on. Um, and we think as part of that, um, committing to membership in an advocacy organization like SCPS is, is a really great way to do that. Um, through, you know, from, through the American Psychiatric Association and SCPS, you can be constantly up to date on what's going on and, you know, get those calls for, you know, please send something to your senator or, or your legislature, you know, different, different ways that you can, you can chip in and be informed. The, the uh, California Medical Association and the local branch, which is LA County, great, another great organization. Um, you know, I, I'm, you know, also an ACAP for ch ch child and adolescent psychiatry. All, there's lots of good ways, um, but really being a member in an advocacy organization is, is a really critical way to make, to make this process work. And the truth is, um, it, it just won't, it won't happen unless you, unless you spend the money. And we don't know how to say it any other way, so we're we're gonna throw it out there. As residents, you get you get you, it's really cheap to be part of APA, and you absolutely should. Like it's really you you need to. When you um, go out into the world and you start seeing the price of being involved in these societies, it, it's steep, and there are, you have a moment where you say, "Is this is this worth it?" Um, and I'm here to tell you it is. That's that's what I can say. I can say that the advocacy we do is critical. The, the support we have in, in Sacramento and in the Capitol in, in DC, those people that we are, are paying to support us being connected with the legislators is critical. It doesn't function without, just like, the, just like we have to have psychiatrists and, and by the way, we, we fly them up there. We fly them to Sacramento with, with your dollars that you pay because that's, that's how important it is. Um, but we have to have the psychiatrists and we need, we, we need that expertise. And we need the expertise on the side of the, of the advocacy in terms of lobbying and how to get the attention of people and legislators that we need attention from. So you have to, you have to pay the money. And that's how that's how we continue to do this. So staying informed and committing to membership are really critical things that you can do. Um, we also think that it's important to speak up when some when you if you're staying informed and you're on top of things, when somebody says something that, you know, isn't, you know, isn't right or or maybe just you need to sh provide another another perspective, a different ways things are happening, then you can you need to speak up and advocate in your training programs and your practice, you know, say when you don't when you see things on social media that you know that you need to comment on you have that background to to say something um and if you want to really come you know get dive in and you know we can give you the tools we can work with you on learning how to email and, and calling your legislators um you can contact us anytime about uh, issues that you're interested in and challenges that you're having and we will let you know if it, you know like how we can start working on it um, and you can become an active member of SDPS. You can join a committee. You can attend advocacy days. You can actually really meet in person with legislators. Um, you can speak with journalists. You can testify. Um, these are things that that you know that are really at that sort of you know if you're willing to if you want to put in that time and that's something that drives you, then we are here to 
to foster that. But I need to go back to saying that um, being a member and committing to that is, is still one of the most critical things. Um, just as a, as a poll, um, APA will be in Los Angeles this, this next May. Um, you know, so you're invited to the reception that we'll be having. I'm sure it will be very swanky. Um, so please, please come by. And when you're, you know, an APA member and you, you get to come to the receptions and do the networking and do the things, um, um, we're very excited about it because it turns out, like, I thought that, like, these organizations would be just about, like, rubbing elbows and whatever with other people. We barely, we're working our butts off, you guys, for advocacy, and we do not have enough parties. Um, we're doing a lot, a lot of Zoom meetings, and um, so I'm very excited to um, meet in person with, with some folks next year. Um, so just to say, you know, part of the reason that being in the organizations is, is how you, um, you know, is important is, is we send out this information every week. If you're part of, of SCPS, you will be getting something from the California State Association of Psychiatrists that give, is like the full rundown of everything that's happening in California mental health. I, I'm, I'm serious. Um, if you just, if you skim that every other week, you are on top of stuff. Okay. Um, and you will know where to go to, you know, if you, someone says something, you'll be able to look it up in your email and say like, oh no, yeah, no, this is, here's the information. Um, and we're writing and, and providing information in the STPS newsletter every month as well. So there's lots of ways for you to um, be involved. Okay. Thank you, Emily. So take away psychiatric advocacy is crucial for our patients and for our profession. Um, psychiatric advocacy is a collective responsibility of all psychiatrists. We talked about it. I know that everyone in this room and on the Zoom gets it. Um, and then, yes, I, as I promised, I would like to ask you all to make this lifelong commitment to supporting psychiatric advocacy we're all volunteers, we all have a day job. Uh, it's not cheap, it's not about the sandwiches. We need everyone to be involved in this. Uh, these are the links to join APA and SCPS. Again, there are lots of other great organizations. Um, and yeah, any any questions? Would, like, would love to take on questions. And Brother. Yes, there no. is one in the uh, online. What is the rescap? Is it yes. So this is an exciting one, and um, mm -hmm. honestly, Eric is the um, Dr. Chung is the is the the true expert on this. But um, it is pretty exciting that I for me in that this has come up because this was something that we really talked about when I was a resident. Like I remember being a second year, and I remember thinking like being like, wait, I'm sorry. So. You write the, you you get the Reese with the 5250, like, so you have to wait first of all, and you have to wait till you have the, the hearing and then you get it. And so like, it already takes like three days. And so you have like 11 days on the 5250 to like start the medication. And then I'm sorry. So then when you, you get the next hold, you have to like have a gap until they have the the next hearing i'm sorry so you have like 11 days like they're just starting to get better and then you like can't medicate them for, i'm sorry, how does who made this who who thought of this right like that was that was the thing and when i was a, a resident it, you know the question it was sort of like what what, what do we do what do we do about this? And I said, well, it's just it's just how the law is, and it's how LA County is interpreting the law, and it's just how it is. Well, we are trying to change that. So that is what the rescap is. It's the difference. It's uh, how the how LA County currently and other counties, and it, that's another reason this is so weird, is that it's different in every county, apparently. Um, you know, who knew that like civil rights, like human rights, differ by county? What anyway? That's something that we're working on with um, with this um, and what what uh, Dr. Chung has been going to testify for is to just explain that and to say we need to have a way to um, when a Reese has already been established and the next hold comes online, a way for us to work this so that we don't have a gap in treatment that actually might prolong the, the holds and the, the hospitalization and the whatnot. That's what we're talking about. Let's see if there's any other questions. Yeah, go for it. Shout it out. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was curious about if uh, y'all can speak to any ways 
that y'all are addressing like any reasons or challenges that getting people involved with organized psychiatry, like inclusivity, like the barriers that exist in our, you know, yeah. acting on people and maybe why the numbers aren't as high because it's clear that's important but um, any barriers. Yeah, well, the, yeah. The, the video, so we have a video and we'll, we can hopefully send it out to everyone that's sort of, because we have felt that. And and I would say that that is what has inspired, you know, Galia and, and for us to, to come out and talk to you. We're actually going to all the residency programs in the CPS area um, and, and to, to, to talk to people about, about this issue. But I think it has been seen as a good old boys club. Like that's the answer. Um, I think that um, when I first came, I it, there was too much, in my opinion, talk about um, about scope creep and things that I don't think are are the should be the main thing that we focus on. I think that's important that we as psychiatrists recognize the special training we have, and it's important that we protect our patients. Um, I also don't think it is our job to police every single other kind of care, for instance. And and um, so I think you know we need to we need to speak up for what we think is right. But I think those are some of the things, like like focusing on um, things that uh, that don't matter to you or is the problem. And that's what we're here to tell you about is that actually. Um, whatever you thought we were focusing on, what we spend the most time talking about at our monthly meetings is, is the government affairs stuff and the different things that we're doing in our committees for access to care and, um, and, and really, you know, partnering with NAMI and, and these other things. And that's, that's actually what we're spending that money and time on now. And so, yeah. And we could say a few words about what we do in, in our DEI, our diverse in culture. Yes. Maybe. So we have a, so one of the committees right. that we have is a diversity and culture committee, which is the, you know, it's the Jedi, whatever, whoever, you know, you want to call the, um, the name of that committee. And, and so that committee actually, um, its role is to, is to bring in more underrepresented um, people in, you know, psychiatrists into the organization, and to to examine every everything we're doing, to examine everything we're doing, and how what in what way it may or may not be inclusive or supporting diversity and equity. Um, and so we often, like the government affairs committee, might uh, take a bill to that committee and say like what can you please like analyze this for us from this perspective and say what how you know how how should we be thinking about this from these different perspectives um so i think that's a that's a really great point and that's that's pretty new that's actually just in the last few i mean that was straight out of george floyd times um that 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 became like what the heck are we doing why don't we have this committee let's take one more question dr cho advocates regarding educating judges because what I see is that like even with a lot of SB one three that's an issue and doing a rotation with ODR in the criminal court where we're trying to divert people to ODR where they get reinstated multiple times due to SUD. The judge that I'm in the courtroom for actually doesn't see SUD as a primary psychiatric illness. So then we are failing to divert them. I mean, granted, you don't have the right treatment. So how do you do that? Yeah. If you have like the judges and like, yeah, and it, so yeah, in case that you can't hear, question. yeah. Oh, you're gonna even yeah. In case, in, in case you couldn't hear, so um, uh, Dr. Cho is asking about um how how we are involved with like um promoting uh, mental health training for judges. Um, so that is something that so I'm personally um involved in, and uh, with. Uh, training for the superior courts for California. I've been putting together a mental health uh, primer that for for judges. I think that this is like this is something that um, the the alternatives to incarceration committee is like uh, is on the the list of things that we want to work on. I would say that at the uh, at the national level, there is a specific part of APA that is devoted to that. And that group is um, like starting to do um, trainings around the country. So like Bianco, uh, Judge Bianco and, and uh, other, you know, um, folks that work at the, um, <laughs> so one of our, you know, a close colleague, Reba Bendra are doing, they're doing a training. And then that once you have more people getting trained in it, then um, you can train more people. So it's something that's in the process um, and um, it is something that we care about. 
Well, we're a minute past or two minutes past. I want to thank our speakers, Dr. Shaner, Dr. Wood, Dr. Reese for being here, Dr. Goldenberg, immediate past president of SCPS for coming out and um, sharing information about how to get involved uh, in this really important professional activity. So thank you.